All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name's James. I'm with uh, Precision Nanosystems. We're based out of Vancouver. And so thank you, uh, Dan, for giving us the invite to come here. And also for uh, having the, um, the workshop around the NanoAssembler platform. So I encourage everyone to, to test out the machine, uh, see how it works. I think, uh, as Dan said, you'll find it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and so our company, uh, we're also a spin out of Peter Collis' lab, who uh, Peter will be talking tomorrow. Uh, and really we set up to solve the challenge around manufacturing and making nano medicines. And, and our goal uh, as an organization really is to accelerate the development and uh, the use, clinical use of uh, these very powerful technologies. So uh, with this being the nano medicine school, I wanted to present uh, similarly in how we describe the technology to our pharmaceutical partners. So we work with a lot of drug companies that are moving nanomedicines towards the clinic uh, using this technology. And just generally when we talk to them about how, um, why, what we're doing, what we're working with them for, describing the uh, drug development and manufacturing process. So shown here is your uh, typical nanomedicine development pipeline. So first you start off with a conceptual nanomedicine. This may be a given type of drug, be it an um, oligonucleotide based therapeutic against a certain indication or target, what have you. So you have some sort of concept. From there you go through uh, quite a bit of development as we've seen in a lot of the great science we're seeing today and uh, yesterday already around in the very early stages looking at developing new technologies to, to go after various uh, diseases. So this is your drug to nanoparticle formulation uh, development. From there, and I think as, as was highlighted by speakers yesterday, you then need to really consider, well, how are you gonna make this into a drug? How are you gonna scale this up? So then you have to consider the manufacturing process, iterate that with your concept and your formulation to come up with a candidate, lead candidate drug. From there, you have to spend further effort and time really identifying the key processes for how your drug's being made and ensuring that you have a very robust manufacturing, manufacturing process. From there, uh, as you go into clinical testing, you need to scale that up to larger and larger scales. And then finally, if you're so lucky that you can uh, achieve clinical success and have an important drug, then it becomes a, a, a nanomedicine product that really can, can have great effect on, on, uh, on patients. Oh, hang on, we're having... Technical difficulties, I think, here. Uh, sorry, just a sec, guys. Oh. I think it might. I'm going to copy it to the... It's a PDF. Yeah, I'll copy it to the desk. Maybe it's just slow with the... All right. All right. All right, so with our technology, and what we have um, at the workshop is our nanosumber benchtop instrument. I'll talk about the science behind this in a second, but really the concept here is that this is a, a, a flagship product of ours, a piece of equipment of ours. This really sits at that uh, development stage and understanding your formulation parameters. From there, also uh, the technology, and it's all microfluidic based, which I'll talk about, but even though we talk about or use the concepts of microfluidics, which is very small plumbing. It's a very scalable technology that we can use to what we call seamlessly scale from your small scales to your very large scales. And through that, uh, really the ability to accelerate the development of these, these very important drugs. So the technology is all microfluidic based uh, and really the magic is in the microfluidics. And through this, the microfluidics enables the exquisite control uh, over, the, over the manufacturing process. And so the microfluidics, the schematic shown here, a typical nanoparticle formulation we do. This is a, a mixing technology where a very standard thing would be to have your, say, uh, in this case, a lipid nanoparticle that makes a RNA or oligonucleotide loaded nanoparticle. So having your nanoparticles in a water miscible solvent like an ethanol, having your oligonucleotides in an aqueous buffer, and in the mixing process, what's happening is you're changing the polarity for which the lipid solvents or the lipids are dissolved uh, and causing them to precipitate out a solution. It's a nanoprecipitation reaction 
And it's a very controlled, uh, using the microfluidics, a very controlled process, really controlling that self-assembly to create these larger nanomedicine structures, the nanoparticle structures. Using microfluidics, we get very good control of what happens when you squish fluids down to small scales, very good control of uh, what's called laminar fluid flow over the fluids of the, of the, the um, two streams coming together. Also, it's what we call controlled and time invariant mixing, meaning that uh, at each given point in time, the same process is happening over and over and over again. We couple that with a very rapid mixing, um, uh, continuous flow mixer device in the microfluidics, allowing us to mix on the order of milliseconds, where the mixing time, we believe, is faster than the self-assembly time, making the nanoparticles. The actual reactor volume would be on the order of tens of nanoliters. Uh, and with all that, you get that very exquisite control and really getting really to the point of uh, the dimensions we're talking about with, with the, the, the nanoparticles themselves. It's also a very low energy input uh, system. So uh, that's important where when we start talking about biologics like oligonucle uh, oligonucleotide therapeutics can be made using this platform. And our, some of our users have, have generated up to 9 kb uh, RNA, mRNA constructs using, using this technology. The flow rates of the individual mixing device is optimized to go between 4 milliliters all the way up to 20 milliliters. So even though it is microfluidics, it is at flow rates that are, are useful for industry and useful for, for drug manufacturing. And then to get to, uh, that enables us to, to say, make a, a liter of nanoparticles on the order of an hour to 90 minutes, to give you some, some uh, concept there. And then when we go to massive scales, we just put these in parallel. We put many of the microfluidic mixers in parallel on a chip or put the chips in parallel themselves. And with what we've done is, is uh, develop the technology to allow us to go from very small scales to very large scales. And this is, this is uh, becoming tremendously useful. So the middle chip there, that is the one that fits into the nano assembler system, which I'll, you guys saw and which you'll be able to, to use. Uh, and that's really the, the flagship system. And it, using the piece of equipment, you can make between a milliliter to 15 milliliters of formulation, which is the ideal amount for, for really rapidly prototyping your system. Uh, we've also gone very to small, very small scales, enabling us to make uh, all the way down to 50 microliters of very well-formed nanoparticle systems. And that's very useful if you're talking about using scarce materials. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more at the end of the talk of, of where we use that. A lot of this focus, what I'll talk about today, is going on the other direction, which is to do very high, high scales, very high volume. So using, uh, when you go towards clinic, you start talking about tens of liters to hundreds of liters. We do this through paralyzation. That chip there is shown, uh, has 20 mixers on a given, on a single microfluidic device, allowing you to do uh, anywhere between 200 milliliters to 400 milliliters per minute of formulation. Uh, with the technology also, we've, we've demonstrated, we have lots of different peer review papers I can point you to, uh, but a lot, a lot of our collaborators now are really expanding this technology, the, the space for which this technology is useful. So quite a few different nanoparticle compositions, uh, solid core lipid nanoparticles, which is uh, the uh, most commonly used system now for RNA and other oligonucleotide delivery, liposomes, emulsions, polymer nanoparticles, even some folks have been using it for, for peptide nanoparticles and all sorts of different uh, interesting things. Really anything where self-assembly is the way uh, to, make, to make these systems and nanoprecipitation. And then also a wide variety of therapeutic cargo, RNA, DNA, small molecules and, and proteins and, and, and others. Um, so shown here, this is the piece of equipment again. I think I've talked about most of this, um, so I won't belabor that point. But I do have a video, so we'll see if we can get this to work, which I'll show you the operation of it, uh, just to, to show you how, how simple it really is. Uh. All right, so I'm just going to pause this. All right, so what you're seeing here is the, the instrument in use, and... Um, to back this up. And what you'll, the, the nanoparticle, or the microfluidic device is in the top chuck there in the center of the instrument. And what you'll see is we rotate it up, and that's to put disposable syringes into two inlets that are in the bottom of the microfluidic chip. 
it rotates up. You'll see the user put the, the, the syringes in there, rotate it back down, and when you operate it, the nanoparticles come out of the front of the, of the system itself. So just opening the lid, rotating the chuck up. Again, two disposable syringes. Here, one syringe would have your lipids and ethanol. Another syringe would have, say, your aqueous, and if you're doing RNA um, systems, your RNA in the aqueous formulation itself. Flip that back down. Uh, you add collection tubes. We have a waste and a collection tube. The reason why we have a waste tube is as the system is pressurizing, uh, you don't want to capture those transients. You only want to capture the steady state. And then it's all computer controlled. Uh, syringes moving at different flow rates, two, two syringes. Uh, after you hit go, your nanoparticle formulations, and then you're done. And so it's, it's, it's really that quick, that quick and which is important because it enables our users now to go from uh, doing just a couple or say a handful of formulations a day to many of our users doing 30 to 50 a day, really accelerating their, uh, um, uh, their productivity, which is great for, uh, for us. Now, with that, I haven't really talked about the advantage of the microfluidics itself, but with the microfluidic technology, because of that control, you really get uh, uh, the ability to then start to do rational design of your nanoparticle uh, systems. So I'll show both the ability to manipulate various characteristics of nanoparticles using process and composition. In the first uh, slide here, the, the processes is, is showing our ability to manipulate the size of the nanoparticle, by changing the flow rate. And in our technology, the flow rate is a proxy for mixing speed. So faster, mix, faster flow rate means faster mixing speed. As we increase the mixing speed, we're able to get what we call limit size uh, nanoparticles. So uh, with that, it's a, a term to define the smallest, most energetically favorable structure based on the composition itself. But as you can see, if you increase the mixing uh, speed as well, you also get into a very stable regime where you have a high robustness of your process. With that, you then can, can start to manipulate various compositions, and, and as we now know, we can manipulate things like surface area components of nanoparticles. In this case, it's manipulating the PEG lipid content in a RNA uh, LMP system. So this is a, uh, a four-component system where the PEG lipid is a stabilizing agent on, on, the, on the surface of, of the nanoparticle. But again, able to uh, increase the amount of, by increasing the amount of PEG, what we're able to do is really uh, drastically reduce the size of the nanoparticles. Shown also, you can see electron micrographs of the different particles of different sizes. So you can see that these, these systems are, are very different um, from each other, even though they're very similar, similar compositions. Uh, this is also done, this, is, this slide is showing the same uh, previous two slides, but using liposomes and compressing it in a single, single figure. So again, if you look at uh, the current liposomal system, say somewhere between 80 and 100 nanometers, uh, and then looking at what we call limit size liposomes, when we, get, we can get down uh, all the way to 20 nanometers, those are very different uh, drugs uh, in, in, in their characteristics and the, their properties. And so again, the plot on the right just showing that you can manipulate through the composition. In this case, it's adding, uh, varying the amount of cholesterol in that composition shown there, the POPC cholesterol, DSP, PEG. Uh, and then also changing the different ratios between flow rates between your two streams, between your aqueous and between your ethanol uh, lipid stream. Again, another property by packaging the microfluidics into the instrumentation that we found is, is it's highly reproducible. So as you saw in the video, it's, you're essentially taking the, the operator right out of the equation. And that's a, been a very um, subtle but, but very important part of this technology where uh, through this, you no longer really need to, to have that one tech or PhD or postdoc that, uh, that can, is, is your formulation person and is the only one that can seem to make your, your nanoparticles and uh, it being dependent on uh, what, what day of the calendar and where the moon is around, around the Earth. And so with this, you know, highly reproducible both in terms of particle size and uh, PDI, but we also see the same thing across encapsulation efficiencies and all other measurable uh, parameters that we've seen as long as you're, you, know, you have a somewhat stable uh, uh, formulation. Also, I should highlight, a lot, this is an interesting parameter as well, or interesting effect as well, as also what this is happening is we're, we now have users all across the world 
and we're able to, 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 to uh, translate our technologies, our nanoparticle technologies, across the different sites, and our users are doing that as well. And so if there's ever an, an issue, worst case scenario is you're mailing buffers and other wetware, uh, but the hardware itself and the process is all, always the same. Uh, through the, uh, this, again, this robustness and also the speed at which you now can, can make these systems, uh, allows to do more systematic engineering around your, your nanoparticle compositions themselves. So shown here is a, what we call a design of experiment across various variables for a certain composition that we've worked on. And this was doing some workup before we went into large scale manufacturing to ensure that we had a, a manufacturing process that would be scalable and, and robust. And so this work, uh, over 30 data points taken in really an afternoon, allowed us to take this composition um, it's not really shown here what composition, but it's irrelevant. But take this composition and get into a regime of parameters that would give us confidence that if we moved to scale it up, we'd have a, a good chance of being successful of having, uh, having that particle made at scale. So then when we start to move into the scale up, uh, the microfluidics is, itself is also, uh, interestingly, um, and probably not, not expected by, by most folks, it's a, also a very seamless scale up system. So to do this, what we do is we put these microfluidics uh, mixers on a single chip in parallel, or we can more simply even what we're doing right now is putting chips in parallel. So this operation would be different than what you saw with the, the benchtop system, where instead you put it in a continuous flow operation, uh, where you have continuous flow pumps, and you have the aqueous and your solvent lipids in two different reservoirs that you draw from pump those through microfluidic mixers all in the same uh, pressures and, 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 and conditions, and then collect them on the outlet. Uh, with this, we typically are doing a dilution step afterwards where we're diluting down the ethanol content for many of our formulations, and then you can uh, put these onto an industrial standard buffer and exchange uh, and concentration system. Typically, people are using dye filtration or, uh, or yeah, dye filtration and tangential flow seems to be the industry standard. And I'll show you some data around, around this. So the continuous flow system, so if we take a, the first step is to take a single mixer and say, well, how long can we run this thing for? So this is doing a sRNA, LMP, a nanoparticle system. Shown here again, the reproducibility between taking the formulation, a two mil formulation made on the nano assembler system, and then the formulation, a single formulation made using our continuous flow system, but in this case, it's fractionated just for, uh, for measurement purposes at each 250 milliliters. And shown here is a, is a liter made in a single mixer. This took about 80 minutes, so it's a pretty, pretty realistic time frame. Um, and then also the next step from there is to say, well, let's paralyze this and, and get some higher volume throughput to, to get the final uh, volume at larger volumes. And so the data shown here shows a, a one mixer, a two mixer, and a four mixer system operating respectively at 12 mils per minute, 24 mils per minute, and 48 mils per minute. And again, we see uh, essentially the same, uh, same particles in each, each system after pooling the, uh, the, the nanoparticles coming off the, the paralyzed mixers. So this has been very encouraging for us. We're now working with pharmaceutical partners to scale up their drugs at, at very large scales. And also, the, very importantly, uh, the particles are stable uh, coming off the system. And this is always very compositional, compositional dependent, but using the nano assembler, you can find compositions that should be very stable. Uh, and then looking after, uh, looking at the uh, the particles after coming off the microfluidic chip, after doing a buffer exchange, and then also after concentrating uh, to getting to your final drug concentration, particle systems are, are very uh, stable and really amenable to industry standard processes. We're now taking our technology, designing for GMP manufacturing. So shown here is this, our GMP schematic, similar to the more simple diagram I showed, where we're doing, uh, first step, we're doing an 8x mixer, uh, including uh, dilution and uh, uh, going to the, the post-processing system. So all in a nutshell, really a, a, a process and a, and a technology that allows you to, to really um, uh, take your, your nanoparticle concepts and use the platform to, to more rapidly and more robustly develop it, develop your systems for, uh, f towards the clinical products, which we're very excited about. Now, for, yeah, so I think I have quite a bit of time. I'll probably be uh, fairly short in my talk. 
but I want, I'm going to spend a little bit more time just talking about uh, the types of nanoparticles that you'll make in your um, in your uh, in the workshop tomorrow. These are the sRNA LMP systems, uh, but also wanted to just highlight a little bit this new technology we developed, which is for very small scale manufacturing of of high quality nanomedicines. And so shown here is just a schematic of the chip, so you have to kind of envision what that looks like. You're looking down on three different wells um, onto a microfluidic chip. And in this case, what we've done is, is we've taken out the need for the instrument, essentially, and we've, we've enabled the ability to have 100% recoverability of the nanoparticles themselves. So in this scenario, what you're doing is you're pipetting in, uh, say, 30 micro, say, if we want to make about 50 microliters or 40 microliters of your final formulation, you're pipetting in just 30 microliters of your aqueous, 10 microliters of your lipid um, uh, ethanol concentrations, and you're actuating the pressure just with a, uh, essentially putting a manifold down and actuating by hand using a uh, disposable syringe, and out comes the, into the buffer solution, out comes your nanoparticles, and you're able to pipette out 100% of those nanoparticle uh, systems really getting to very very small volume concentrations and we're using this a lot uh, under our other uh, technology brand we call the sub nine kits which is really selling or providing the nanoparticles uh, the LMP systems to uh, people that don't really care about nanomedicines more molecular biologists but want to deliver RNA into primary cells and into in vivo and so this technology has been used mainly for primary cell delivery uh, with this, the LMPs that we do make uh, in the sub-9 kits and what you'll make tomorrow are what we call these solid core RNA lipid nanoparticle systems. And they really are very effective delivery systems. This is similar to technology that's being brought towards the clinic by, by a few different uh, nanoparticle groups now, or a few different, sorry, um, uh, oligonucleotide drug companies. And with this, um, what, what's happening is we're really mimicking your natural endogenous lipid nanoparticle systems in your body. So when you go to your doctor and they talk about good and bad cholesterol, your LDL and HDL particles, uh, those are nanoparticle systems, as I'm sure many of you know, that are used in your body to deliver cholesterol and other, other molecules throughout cells in your body. Uh, with this, uh, showing a molecular model around the types of nanoparticles uh, we made, and this was done in, in Peter's lab in a collaborator of his, to really model the structure of these, these nanoparticles. Again, they're these solid core structures with the nucleic acid on the inside, and similarly to the LDL, HDL particles having an amphiphilic shell of, of the, the, in this case, it would be a, a lipid uh, component uh, with pe or a, a PEG component on the outside. And what happens when you inject these into animals, humans, or into your petri dish is they uptake the lipoprotein. They steal the lipoprotein from your endogenous, from your blood, or from your endogenous lipid nanoparticle systems. So shown here in this schematic, uh, if you, you add these nanoparticles. They take that APOE, and they're uptaken into cells through the APOE receptor, so the LDL uh, receptor. A very efficient, uh, very useful way to get into the cells. With this, we've demonstrated this technology uh, with collaborators at UBC around delivery into primary neurons. So I'll just show a little bit of data here on that. Uh, and again, this is showing that it is an APOE-mediated effect. So on the bottom slide, or on the bottom panel, we've added APOE to a, uh, a, a culture of primary, uh, pure culture of primary hippocampal neurons. In the top. In the top um, panel, it's the same, same cells, but no APOE. Uh, the, the nanoparticles are, are labeled with dye. And you can see that the particles get into the cells and when you add the APOE, meaning it's, uh, or demonstrating that's an APOE-mediated effect, um, with the, shown here with the red, the red, red cells shown there. Also, uh, as you guys know, in doing the RNA delivery, these systems are very potent. So we get high uh, potent delivery into, into neurons. And also, importantly for our, uh, the neuroscientists that are using this technology, we get close to 100% uptake of the, of the particles into cells. And this is a big deal for those guys that are typically using electroporation, lipofectamine, other crappy technologies that um, really only enable you to get somewhere between 10 and, and 50%. So again, using this technology and, and, and giving it to folks um, uh, that have high use for it and great need for it. Also, just very quickly, I'll go through this data. Um, these particles, because they are really these, these clinical-based uh, technologies, 
Very low toxicity. Again, this is an E18 primary hippocampal neurons, pure culture. Toxicity measured with an LDH assay as a measure of toxicity. And we see that at a over 40 times dosage, we see zero, essentially no toxicity compared to the uh, um, uh, delivered nanoparticles in the previous slide shown here. Also with this, that was shown in, in vitro with primary cells. In vivo, this, this, this technology works very, very well as well, the nanoparticles. Uh, but to get into the brain, you have to mechanically get across the blood-brain barrier. We do this mechanically uh, by either through direct injection. So the neuroscientists do all sorts of, of uh, experiments that, that I do not have experience in, but uh, doing things like direct injecting directly into the brain and then measuring uh, molecular uh, effects around the site of injection. So we can see that the nanoparticles are able to get, um, get good knockdown within a fair distance from the site of uh, injection, in this case, all the way out to about a, a millimeter from the, uh, direct, uh, the injection track. And this is injecting uh, half, a, half a microliter of uh, 5 mg sRNA per mil. Um, other types of injection that people are using into the brain include this ICV, which is intracerebral ventricular uh, administration. This goes into a cavity in the brain, and again, uh, getting good uptake, in this case, more widespread uptake into the brain, uh, both into the hippocampus and into the striatum. And now we've, we've been able to transfer some of these methods and technologies to other groups, including uh, groups at the Wiseman Institute and others, and, and people are now having success doing all sorts of different biology with the technology, uh, including sRNA for gene knockdown, mRNA for protein expression, uh, using antimers, microRNAs for studying microRNA biology, and, and, and others. Uh, finally, just showing some data. This is a, uh, one of our collaborators at UBC doing studying uh, brain swelling and using the technology in, in place of, say, using viruses or using genetically engineered mice to start to look across his uh, genetic or his molecular pathways and trying to understand what genes are involved in various uh, disease processes. So he's looking, in this case, it's a data of, of seeing a gluon one knockdown in vivo, uh, really, and, and, and seeing the phenotype resulting from that, leading to, to various biological um, hypotheses and, and conclusions in his work. Lastly, and you probably can't see it on the screen there, so you have to take my word for it, but we're also heavily involved in mRNA delivery and other types of delivery systems as well. Uh, and so getting very good protein expression using mRNA constructs. And I, I think this is a, a very exciting area. Lots of uh, interest in the drug world, but also in the research world as well, using this as a tool to, uh, uh, to more rapidly do functional genomics. So i uh, just like to acknowledge all the people at Precision uh, that have helped with a lot of this work, as well as the various groups and folks at, the, at UBC where we spent a lot of our time, and also the funding agencies that have supported our work uh, over the past few years. Great.